Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. I should have started drinking before I logged on. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs> you know what? I'm already lost. That's your thing, Jordan. You're all, wow. You say yeah. something and you go, right? <laughs> Is this being recorded? Magic mice creatures. I should have thought of that. Screw it! <laughs> See, I knew I set myself up. You guys have been passing the joint around while I was going at it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you for being ridiculous there. I could put that in the intro. <laughs> Welcome back to Hide and Create. This week's topic is Christopher Vogler's The Hero's Journey, which of course is a reduction of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. I'm Jordan Ellinger. With me today are my co-hosts, Moses Surgar, Joshua Esso, and Jay Wells, who is filling in for Diana Rowland. So without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to Joshua. Go ahead, Joshua. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Vogler's The Hero's Journey? Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, what's The Hero's Journey? It's also called the monomyth. Joseph Campbell, of course, is heavily associated with this. Um, oh, the title of this book, Jordan, remind me, what was the title of this book again? The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Hero with a Thousand Faces, correct. Okay, um, so Joseph Campbell's search for patterns in our myths and our legends and our dreams and even in our psychology um, that show up over and over again. And what he found was a particular kind of story that involved the character going on an epic adventure uh, that on, not only saves the day, but unalterably changes him for the better, or her for the better. Um, also changing, uh, hopefully, society, or the the culture that he's from in some way as well. So there are, there are 12 stages, usually. Um, there are actually several versions that are uh, easy to find if you troll the interwebs, but I like the 12 stages. So stage one, an ordinary world, or I've also seen it called an uncomfortable home. For example, Neo has been searching night after night, but he doesn't know what he's looking for. He just knows that something isn't right in the world and something has to be done about it. This is a great stage to do really well so that the differences between where the protagonist starts and where he finishes are very starkly contrasted. I love this kind of thing in zombie movies and in zombie novels especially, where we get that little slice of life before all hell breaks loose. Um, for example, uh, Dawn of the Dead, I thought, did a great job of this. It wasn't long. Uh, it gave us hints that something was a little bit creepy, a little bit off, but it wasn't so obvious that all the characters caught on to it. It showed how life was, and more importantly, where our, how our protagonist was before all the crap went down. Okay, um, does anybody have uh, anything they'd like to say about uh, the uncomfortable home or the ordinary world? Yeah, this, well, is, you know, this is your typical farm boy start to any fantasy novel from the Wheel of Time to anything else out there. It's just, you start and there you go, there's your farm boy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Wheel of Time, uh, Mistborn also did it. Um, second stage is called The Call to Adventure. Uh, that's where it becomes clear to the character that, yeah, there is something wrong and something they have, and it's not just something has been, they have to do something about it. The, the stakes are defined in the second stage. Um, that's when Neo gets that phone call while he's sitting in the office from Morpheus to warn him about all the agents that are coming for him, or when uh, Luke Skywalker stumbles over the hologram of Princess Leia. This would also be in you know different formats called the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. I heard it the, called as someone comes to town. <laughs> stranger comes to town. Yeah. 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 Then we go on to the third stage, which is the refusal of the call. Um. Uh, so Neo looks down from that office, uh, from the top of that office building when he's trying to escape the agents, and he thinks, no effing way am I crawling across this ledge, right? Because it's a billion feet down. Uh, this is where Luke whines about how far away everything is and, and all the chores <laughs> and responsibilities he's got with his uncle. Uh, this is about the fear of the unknown and, and of change, um, and that, uh, and some extra steps are, are usually required to push that character over the edge to decide that, okay, yeah, I'm scared, but I'll still do it anyways. Uh, they can learn what really happened, quote unquote, like Luke finding out that his father was actually a Jedi and not a freighter pilot, or uh, Neo being shown the world uh, that he knew as not so much the real world. Uh, another way that the character could be pushed over the edge is they might be given a special item like a lightsaber or a blue pill. Uh, then we go on to stage. So two. actually, before you go on, so this Please. this is really important. It's 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 the refusal of the call. The hero, in some way, has to say, "No, I don't wanna." And the reason it's really important to see the reason why. I mean, well, from a storytelling point of view, 
um, you have your protagonist. If you have this, this is one angle of it. It's not the whole thing. But if you have a protagonist who says, <clears throat> after the call to adventure, who says, "Oh, heck yeah, I'll go save the world," it's just not as compelling because they kind of seem like an egotist, you know. Whereas the farm boy who says, "Ah, who am I to go save the world?" Then you kind of start rooting for that guy because you shouted like Luke. You know? I don't yeah. want to. <laughs> you know exactly. It's 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 a, it's an important thing about your protagonist. Typically, you know that they're a little reluctant for some reason to go be the hero, to go be the protagonist of of the story. And you know you don't want to have someone who seems you know wishy washy to the point of being weak, but you don't also don't, you want them to be humble. You don't want them to just feel like, yeah, I got this save the world business all wrapped up. So that's that's and part of on. Yeah, that's part of the refusal of the call. And then after they refuse the call, the next comes um meeting the mentor. Or I mean it's called it's called the mentor, but it could also just be having a very serious discussion with an already established mentor. Uh this is where the character succeeds in overcoming that initial fear. Sometimes of course with a kick in the ass. Uh Neo meets Morpheus. Luke gets taken under the wing of Kenobi after he finds out his aunt and uncle are dead. See, that's what Luke needed to get over it. He had actually mm-hmm. to have his family killed before he was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, about meeting the mentor, um, I just, I don't know, something that was kind of interesting for me when I wrote my first book, I very deliberately did not have a meeting the mentor element to the story. Even though I had these characters who had learned interesting, powerful magic, I just... Uh-huh. The first version of the story actually had, a, you know, the characters, you know, sitting around some of the sages in Palawan. They're sitting around meditating and learning from their senseis or whatever. And I just completely cut that out of the story because I just thought, you know, that's just, that's the formula. I don't want to follow the formula. Um, and I don't know, hopefully the book didn't suffer for that. But <clears throat> the the sequel, which is the one I'm still writing, The, the Ninth Wind, I very much wanted to have a meeting meeting with the mentor element to it. Um and you have like Idonia and she kind of has, goes off and wants to find this sort of witch in the woods that she's looking for to teach her, you know, how to, how to be, um, a powerful woman. Um, and it, you know, and it's fun. And I think that sometimes you, you, you want to follow the script. This is getting into a, a meta sort of thing here. You know, how much do you want to follow the hero's journey? And I'm sure we'll all have thoughts on this, but I think sometimes you don't want, obviously you don't want to follow the script blindly. Uh, a lot of readers are, are, are so aware of the hero's journey. <clears throat> at this point, that they're almost turned off by things that follow the script too much. Um, and yet at the same time, these Joseph Campbell, when he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he went through the mythology of the world, the religions of the world, and found what he believed were the, the common archetypal paths that pretty much you know all cultures share to, to, to a large degree. So this is really archetypal stuff that is deep within us. And there's nothing wrong with going to what's really true about the human experience and the, and the hero's journey in myth and in religion and, and in story. Um, and so it is, a, it is a good thing at times to touch on these points, and it does resonate with us. Um, if, you, you know, if you write a story that follows every single point to a T, then that's, you know, that's one thing. If you're obvious about it, that's one thing. But it's good to play with some of it, and, and I've enjoyed having a meeting with the mentor element in the book that I'm currently writing. Yeah, and I actually think that even if it's totally obvious, the story can still be good. I mean, well, it, if you handle it right. Go ahead, Jay. Well, I, I mean, I think this is an important point to make, and I'm sure we'll get into this more once we get through all the steps, but the hero's journey isn't necessarily a plot structure. It's, it's um, you know, Campbell's really closely associated with Carl Jung, and there's this whole um, element of the hero's journey that's about um, an internal journey, that the that the character goes through and their development to get to the, become the self actualized hero they go from you know the farm boy to the hero and there's this internal process that has to go on so even if you aren't I think a lot of new writers look at the hero's journey and they're like, oh, that's a plot point, that's a plot point, that's a plot point, when really they're missing the nuance of, no, that's a that's a character arc issue. That's about 
a lesson that this character needs to learn on this journey. It's not necessarily like, oh, well, the mentor needs to walk in now. It can be a metaphor. It doesn't have to be, you know, literal. I'm ticking off all these boxes and now I have a story. And I think that's why you end up with a lot of kind of formulaic stories based on the hero's journeys because people look at this chart and they say, I have to hit all these points, and they don't take the time to learn about the nuances of the archetypes and what they mean and why they're there and what it says about a person's evolution. And that's also a level of using the hero's journey that you need to include. So it's yeah. internal and external is basically what I'm saying. So. Yeah. yeah um, Christopher Vogler, <clears throat> who, you know, adapted um, – Joseph Campbell's material for like, you know, he wrote a book on, you know, for writers basically. And he, he teaches, uh, I, I had audio of an entire course he gave on sort of screenwriting based on the hero's journey. Um, and, and it is, you know, it is a big thing in, in, in Hollywood. And he talked about things how like one of the points we haven't gotten to yet, we'll get to the, uh, uh, the point at which somewhere around the middle of the story, there's, there's death. You, you encounter death. And he's like, you know, so often that the Hollywood, will do that or the chase scene. Oh, I hate the chase scene, but every end of every Hollywood movie <laughs> has a chase scene. I they mean, love the chase scene. nine out of 10, there is something chasing something. <clears throat> and Hollywood <laughs> is, is kind of a slave to a lot of the stuff. And a, and a lot of it, a lot of it comes from the hero's journey material. Um, so it's interesting to be aware of that and watch some of the stuff and realize that like, you know, Hollywood has kind of confined itself to doing certain things that it's it, it believes it's supposed to do in a lot of ways. Well, it's because they take they take the journey too literally as plot points. But um, you were, you mentioned the Chris Vogler thing. There's a really great um, discussion between Chris Vogler and Michael Haig, who also does a lot of talk about the hero's journey, um, where they one of them tackles the external journey and one tackles the internal journey and they do it kind of concurrently in this talk. It's really fantastic. If mm -hmm. you can get it on Michael Haig's site, probably Chris Vogler's too, but you should. Oh, so, so you're telling people to go listen to something more awesome than us. After, <laughs> after they listen to our wisdom, <laughs> they can seek other people to support our wisdom <laughs> um, and tell them that we sent them. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we're talking about, the, the monomyth, and we're, we're given these steps as a formula. I Moses doesn't like the the guardian step. The um, I mentor. Forget, the mentor. I call it the guardian. I think a lot of um, that's a fairly common term. Term um, for me that you know, that that isn't just the, the wise old wizard like Gandalf. That can just be a, a friend, right? If it's a if it's a war story, then it will be a maybe a veteran. Um, it, 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 it all it is is it's somebody that's just somewhat wiser than their protagonist and that represents parents right you know like parents elders it's the elder wisdom right and i think that everybody relies on that even as adults i still go to my parents for for wisdom you know like uh so i i feel like that's a fairly important part of the story that i try to include whenever i can and that tends to keep the character humble it's not a get out of jail free card which maybe is what uh Moses, you were you were saying you try to avoid, right? Like uh, using the guardian because it's you know, it can be a little bit Deus Ex Machina. But for me, in my stories, that's fairly important. So we can all kind of use uh, different parts of the hero's journey, um, you know, in our, in our own writing. Yeah, just to clarify, I just avoided it in the first book because I thought it was almost cliche. Mm. Uh, in the second book, I've totally enjoyed and like embrace doing that so it's not like i have a thing about it it's just you know i've just go, done it different ways yeah. like but like you said i mean it could be peter parker you're talking to uncle ben and uncle ben tells him something profound and then you know spider-man goes off and has his whole journey yeah yeah so, right well he you know he tells him that uh there's all kinds of responsibility with like some power and stuff it's something like that <laughs> something like that <laughs> okay so then we move on to step five dun 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 uh, Bum, 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 bum. Crossing the first threshold. Uh, that's the moment when all the travel is done, the preparation is over, uh, Daniel san has learned the crane kick, and he, he is ready to accept the consequences for dealing with the problem at hand. So Neo goes off into the Matrix to speak to the Oracle. Um, Luke meets Han, uh, Han who uh, takes him off tattooing under Imperial Fire. Um, 
Of well, course. Sometimes there's a threshold guardian here, which Han, I guess, would count as that. Um, you gotta say Han. There, you'll Han? get. All, yeah, you're gonna catch lots of flack. Don't say Han. Oh lord. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That dude with the Wookiee, um, that they, that you meet, that, you know, you, that there's somebody there who takes you literally or figuratively across a threshold. So a lot of times that threshold is, um, personified as a person. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the point where, you know, we're definitely leaving the ordinary world, which is stage one, ordinary world. And now we're crossing the threshold into the, the not ordinary world. The special and it, world. And it can happen in many different ways. It's true. Mm-hmm. So then it goes on to stage six, which is tests, allies, and enemies. Uh, this is where the protagonist starts to experiment with uh, with his or her new world to find out what it's really about. And it's basically a sort of what can I eat and what will eat me type of phase. <laughs> uh, they they learn their first real, real world lessons. Um, the spoon uh, the spoon is impossible to bend, but they aren't right. Yeah, and this is, this is also where, you know, where you, you get the gang together. You know, you meet the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and you start to assemble the band. Yeah. There's also uh, an optional step here of meeting the Prophet, uh, which for Neil was the Oracle, obviously. Um, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is, what bakes your noodle, is would you have still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? I know, it was a fantastic reading. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> we won't. <Honestly. laughs> Do you like the Matrix? I can't tell. Do you like no, it? no, I thought it was really kind of crappy. Yeah, uh, I haven't watched it. You know, something like thirty or forty times, probably. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It is actually a good, a it's good a... example of the hero's journey. So oh, it's a great example. Really they follow well, it. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> like literally every stage they hit it. Yep. Um, so stage seven, that's where the character makes his approach and preparation, or it's also called the inmost cave. Uh, this is the crossing of the second major threshold in, in the story. And at this point, the protagonist is deeply involved in the new world and getting ready to face the big bad. There's a little bit more training, perhaps. Um, Neo and Trinity get all the guns, lots and lots of guns. Luke makes it to the hidden rebel base and um, gets the briefing on the Death Star. Um... And then stage eight, this is the supreme ordeal. This is where it is. Um, the severe test that probably involves facing death, I'm sorry, facing death or actually dying. Uh, this is where the character comes up against his or her greatest fears and maybe even uh, hits rock bottom in the story. Uh, this is where the slow motion gun battle in the lobby of the off- office building culminates in a slow motion dance move to avoid the bullets, um, taking a little X-wing in to blow up something that is not a small moon. Uh, I think that this stage is the crux of the hero's journey, um, personally. I think up to this point, we've been led to identify with the hero um, and, and his or her fate. But what happens to the hero happens to us in this, uh, you know, if we've been doing it correctly. And this is where our emotions are temporarily shot all to hell so that they can be euphorically elevated by the hero's return from death later. Um, you've got to have something to say about that, Moses. Yeah, I <laughs> I realized that... that I looked back when I wrote um, my first book, and in the Black Gods War, in, in almost exactly in the middle of it, there's a death. And this point, when I listened to Christopher Vogler's like whole workshop on screenwriting with the hero's journey, he he really stressed how like the middle of the movie there's like a death, that there's some theme around death. It's not always just that, but that's typically what it is. And uh, it's just fascinating that 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 happens, and like. I thought it was fascinating that I just instinctively did that. I wasn't trying to follow the hero's journey at all when I did that. But the way I just wrote my story, there was a death right in the middle of the story. And, and you'll see this in a lot of Hollywood movies. Um, but it's, you know, it, it reminds me that there's an archetypal process of storytelling that the hero's journey, you know, describes. And we do it instinctively in many cases. And that's just kind of cool that we just there's an instinct to storytelling that makes these things happen in a certain order but this is this is even though it's number eight this happens somewhere around the middle of the story Mm -hmm. uh and then next comes the reward that's the ninth stage if you know the character survives (laughs) uh this is where trinity realizes that neo is the one and she loves the one 
But more so, more so than that, Neo begins to believe that he's the one. That I think that's the more important part. Yeah, he fights Agent Smith and he wins. You know, he throws him, he literally throws him under the train. Um, greater knowledge and understanding can be just as valid and great of, as a, of a reward as, you know, pulling the sword from the stone. So it doesn't have to be a physical thing. It doesn't have to necessarily be Luke and, and Chewie and Han standing, you know, up in front of the awards assembly and getting a gold medal. Uh, that's pretty, you know, um, literal definition or a translation of reward. It could be lots of different things. Um, you guys must have examples of other reward types. Well, I was just going to say that in, instead of just focusing on, like, the external plot points of this, that the ordeal is, like, the moment of doubt. This isn't going to happen. It's the black moment. I can't do it. And then the reward is realizing that you are a hero and that you can actually pull this off. And so it's not a reward in, like, a tangible form, but it's an internal change that happens within the character that allows them to reach their goal. Right. You know, and sometimes the ordeal is actually realizing their original goal isn't the goal they should have been going after. So the death is the death of this, like, idealized goal that they were going after. And then the, the reward is getting what they really needed, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And it's a, it's a very transformational moment in the story where the hero, <clears throat> the hero changes based on what just happened with that ordeal. Right. Yeah. And then it moves on to uh, the road back. So uh, I, th- I think this is where uh, this is where the hero kind of collects themselves and um, starts to deal with the consequences of confronting the big bad. Uh, there's actually yeah this is the part, this is the the stage where the the chase scenes happen. So uh, there's <laughs> almost always a chase scene. Uh, Neo runs away from the reincarnated, reincarnated Smith. You know, he turns into the hobo, and then is chased by three agents as he tries to get to the phone. Um, the important thing about this stage is that the hero may decide to return home to the ordinary world, and that the special world may have to be left behind. I just so hope I never write a book with a chase scene in it. Oh, it, is so, <laughs> <laughs> it is so formulaic. I just, just uh, okay. I'm sorry. Maybe you should write the best chase scene ever. Yeah, read one of my books sometime, uh, Moses. I I use the chase scene fairly often because uh, it's easy to write when you're under a deadline, right? As as Italian writers often are, um, and you can make it really fun and really involving. I wrote a book, uh, a novella with a buddy of mine, Steve Savile, called Martyrs, and almost the first third of it is a chase scene because that was under a huge deadline crunch. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like, it's just, it's 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 really, it's fun, you know. It's just, you, you set it in a car, and then it, you know, like, a, the car goes uh, off a cliff into a river, and then you just, you, you the trick to writing a really effective uh, chase scene is to um, switch the setting all the time, right? So it, it becomes fresher, right? So instead of, you, you leave the car, and you jump on a bicycle or whatever, you know, like, you just kind of, you know, you can you can definitely make chase scenes fun. I, I think that when you say it's so formulaic, you've just read a lot of bad chase scenes. You know what? It's really movies. I really that's 100 percent movies. Like I just when I see a Hollywood movie and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, we're seven eighths the way through the movie. Here's the chase scene. Like it's strictly <laughs> my hatred of Hollywood doing that to every single movie I see. Have you seen Ronan? Ronan, Ronan, Ronan. I don't remember. That's the best chase scene in movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um, stage 11 is resurrection. This is where the hero has to face death, death once more, um, but with higher stakes. That's the important part. Death again, but it's much, much more, uh, much worse things can happen. This is the big bad's last dying move. Uh, shout out to my brother. <laughs> is that Something... when, like, the, the bad guy, you think he's dead, but then he exactly. rises from the ground, and yeah. all of a sudden, you know. Yeah. 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 When, when or, my or brother the, and I, or the hero, hero, you think, oh, hero. he's dead. No, he's back. Yeah. <laughs> when my brother and, and I were younger, we uh, would constantly, quote unquote, play fight, right? And we'd have this cast of characters that we would choose from, and then they would fight. And each character got to be so cliche, we even recognized it as little kids. That every time we fought, 
the bad guy had to get back up and have a last dying move. So <laughs> every character we had had like a special, like we defined it, their last dying move. <laughs> and we would preface it that way too. We'd use that voice, last dying move. <laughs> Josh, Josh was actually 12 years old, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> 12 is awesome. Um, okay, so the last dying move. And then uh, something that really tests them on all levels, right? Something that tests them on everything that they learned on the journey so far. This is their final exam. Did you really learn everything from the Supreme Ordeal? Uh, pass or fail. And then we go on to the, to the last stage. The last but not least stage, of the return with the elixir is the official name of it. Um, it's some kind of magical return to life from apparent death. And it, again, it doesn't have to be an, uh, like a literal bottle of magic. A fluid. Uh, this could be um, the hero, like Neo, how he revives after being shot a bunch of times by Smith. I mean, he's gunned down, but he was on the cusp of a realization that he bends, not the spoon. And after a brief rest, uh, he gathers his thoughts. He stands back up, renewed. There he is again. Um, it was like the stakes had to be the highest they could possibly be, his life, in order for him to completely accept his call. Uh, anyway, th- this returns. This return from apparent death could be also very a uh, lot broader. Like for a culture, or for a city, the hero uh, might be bringing back a, sacred stones, or the children, or freedom, uh, or some kind of great knowledge. The idea is that the hero has to be on this big, epic quest and change and learn and overcome, but also bring back something to share with everybody else. Or you know, otherwise it was just all some big self indulgent waste of time. And there we have it. Those are our 12 stages. I think it's also inter- I think it's important to show that the hero has to reintegrate themselves into everyday life or at least their new life um having acquired the wisdom that they they perceived, right? Like mm-hmm. like like there has to be some sense that the hero is going to be able to continue to live after the end of the novel, right? That they've found some new equilibrium. Well, yeah. that they'll continue with what they learned on that journey. It's not like, well, I just did it this time, and now I'm going to go back to the ordinary world. Like, you can't yeah. just go back to the way your life was before, and that they're forever changed by this experience, yeah. you know? So. Unless I, it's a time, wanna... in which case they do have to go back <laughs> to exactly the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was gonna, I was gonna point one thing out that um, I took this class one time um, by a um, about how the hero's journey is also um, kind of encapsulated in the tarot, and that the major arcana, um, the twelve of those, if you follow that, it follows. It's called the fool's journey. And, you know, cause the first, the first card is the fool and that that's the hero in the ordinary world and it goes all the way through all the different steps. And so it follows the exact same kind of path as the hero's journey. I just thought that was interesting, just a different way to look at it. That's a little more kind of archetypal and symbolic. So yeah, that's a great point for sure. I, I think I've heard that as well. Okay, we're going to cut it off there for the week. I have a bit of a confession to make. This episode, uh, when we were recording it, ran quite long uh, because uh, right about here we got into a huge argument about the Chosen One uh, mythos or the Chosen One um, adaptation of the hero's journey. So uh, we're not going to edit that out. We are going to share that with you guys, but you'll have to wait until next week because we felt like it was maybe veering away a little bit from the hero's journey and we wanted to keep things separate. So tune in next week where Moses and I discover that we have diametrically opposite philosophies when it comes to chosen ones. So uh, it's quite an exciting episode and we look forward to seeing you then. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso, and my co-hosts have been Jay Wells and Moses Serva. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions or suggest topics for future shows. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider reviewing us on iTunes, liking our Facebook page, or subscribing to the Hide and Create YouTube channel. That's all for now. Now go hide and create something.